addition to what President Jones has said, or to add my personal congratulations to you for your desire to study, we do congratulate you for your interest in the Word of God and in the book of Acts and in learning more about Christianity. Let me assure you that this is a student-centered study. The teachers aren't doing this to get any raise in salary. We're doing it because we love you and love your work. We not only congratulate you for your desire to study more about Christianity and the Word of God and now particularly the book of Acts, but also that you've chosen this particular method of study and that you've chosen to study by means of the IBC video tapes. There are many excellent tapes that you might have gotten on uh, the Word of God from various sources and that have uh, excellent academic qualifications. We certainly don't minimize the importance of academics here, but let me assure you, and it will make, give you more confidence in your study, to realize that we are very interested in you, and we are teaching not only as teachers of academic qualifications, but also that we are teaching as men who can identify with your work, as men who have been where you are, and can understand the problems and questions you might have. Many of the teachers that you will be listening to on these tapes have or still are serving as elders and deacons. They've been full-time evangelists and ministers. They've done local work. That means they've done funerals and weddings, gospel meetings, still do, do door knocking, campaigns both overseas and in the United States. We visit nursing homes. We've been in the jails, the hospitals, and home studies. And that means when you phone us or you write us with questions relating to our lessons, that we may not always know the answers, but at least we have had the experience as well as academic studies that help us to appreciate and sympathize and understand the kind of work you're doing. So these studies are not done for mercenary reasons. They're not done because of just they're part of our job, but our desire to really study with you. Uh, words would be very difficult to find for me to tell you how honored I am and how much I appreciate the opportunity for us to study together this great book of the New Testament. We begin by asking the question, why study? Why do you want to study this book of Acts? Well, there's some light reasons you might give. You might say, well, because your excellent dean has listed it among the required subjects. And if I get my certificate, I've, I have to do that. I'm sure that's not your only reason. Uh, it's not an ego trip to feel that you know more about the Bible than someone else. Uh, it's not for any selfish reason. What are the deep, real motives for studying this book as well as any book in the New Testament? Well, number one, because of who it is from. It is the Word of God. It is inspired by God. It is a love letter from God, as are all the 27 books of the New Testament and the 39 of the Old. The source of something always has something to do with its value. If you had an autographed copy of a letter from Abraham Lincoln or George Washington, uh, if it was just talking about the weather, or uh, however frivolous the contents might be, the very fact that it came from a president of the United States would make it very, very valuable. In moving from a third world country back to the States at one time, and I've had very good experience generally with uh, all of my missionary work, but one of the few sad moments was that one of the 55-gallon drums that we used to ship back my materials contained in it the last letters that my father wrote me. He died while I was away and was, I was able, unable to come back. And in those letters, there was no will. There was no uh, important information that I needed to know after his death. Probably they were just saying, how are you, and telling me about the weather and the politics here in America. But they were very, very valuable to me simply because they were from my father. And this book of Acts has other reasons to be very important. It does have content, unlike my father's letters, that are very, very important. But first of all, simply because the God that created you loved you enough to create you in his image, loved you enough to let his son die for you, loved you enough to let you be the only part of his creation that uh, is given dominion over all the other creation, given this beautiful earth and we're told to take care of it. That God has written a letter. And without knowing anything about the contents, that fact alone makes me want to know very, very much what this letter says. And I value it because of its source. Uh, Paul said all scriptures inspired of God and is proper for doctrine, for proof, for, cor for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly or perfectly furnished, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. So we study it because it is from God, is inspired of God. Peter said 
that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And therefore, no scriptures of any private interpretation. Unlike some have said, this is not talking about uh, whether or not you can privately study and understand the Bible. He's really not talking about how we, what we do with the scriptures after we get them. But he's pointing out the same fact that Paul was in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that these scriptures are from God. Moses didn't sit down under a palm tree and say, well, I'm a man of vast experience. I was trained in Egypt, the, the leading country of the world at that time, and I've been a shepherd, and I've known this person and that, and therefore here's my idea about God. David didn't sit down and say, well, I'm a musician. Uh, I've killed the lion and the bear. I've killed the giant. I've been a great military man. I've been a king, and this has given me vast experience. So I want to give you my view of my interpretation. Peter's not saying, he's saying that's not what happened but that this, these letters, including the book of Acts, are letters that men privately did not write from their own mind and opinions, but they were given what is said by the Word of God. So you and I are studying the book of Acts together because it's inspired of God, it's from God, He's the author of it. Not only that, I want to study this book because I know the great care that God has given to preserve it for me these 2,000 years. We've talked already about its important study because of its source. Let's talk a little bit about how it's been providentially taken care of. Two scriptures that, and two thoughts based on the scripture that really give me great encouragement and, and uh, motivation is the one when Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. Possibly the people at that time did not appreciate what that meant because they had not yet been oppressed as much as they were to be later, nor were the scriptures attacked as they were much later. But that gives me much, much encouragement that Jesus says, my word will always be here. Also, the scriptures in 1 Thessalonians 4 and in 1 Corinthians 15 that teaches us they will be Christians when the Lord comes again. Those are two very, very important facts that are so encouraging to those of us who believe in the Bible and believe in God. That the word of God in some form, some way will always be here. Satan is not going to destroy it till the end of this world and that there will always be God's people. They may be even greater in number at one time than they are another, but there will always be God's people. There will be God's people when the Lord comes again. But back to the thought about the preserving the Scripture. The reason I want to study this book is when I stop and think about what God has done to preserve it. Think about in the first century when it became against the law to read Scripture. Many people think that the book of Revelation was written in apocalyptic or symbolic language, code language, for that very reason, that when the Roman soldier reached inside the cloak of the Christian and jerked that paper out and read it, he would not recognize it as being Scripture. It doesn't sound like Luke. It doesn't sound like Acts. But at that time, they were so persecuted, and the, the, there was military might brought to bear to try to destroy the Scriptures and destroy, destroy Christianity. It was according the Scriptures of that time by the church. Uh, Christians were wrapped in cloth and soaked in fuel and set afire and used as living candles, or dying candles in this case, around the patios of Roman people while they danced and danced and gambled and ate and engaged in sexual orgies. Uh, Christians were taken out instead of uh, watching the Super Bowl of entertainment, which uh, we do sometimes in the States, or other great athletic events, uh, they were taken out to watch these Christians fight wild animals. They were beheaded and crucified, and the spear was often put to their heart, and the question was asked, Whom shall it be, Lord Caesar? A Lord Christ. And if they said Lord Christ, that spear was often plunged into the heart. They were imprisoned. Some were banished like John to work on the islands where slaves were made to work in the salt mines. And all of this is simply to say that God somehow by his providence has preserved this book these years along with others that I might have the opportunity to study them. That gives me a sense of reverence for them. It gives me a sense of appreciation to God. And therefore, since the book of Acts has as its source God Almighty, and since it has been preserved by God in His providence to fulfill the prophesy, prophecy of Jesus, when He says, heaven and earth will pass away, my word will not pass away, then I want to study it. Third reason is because of the personal changes the study of this book can make in my life and make in your life. It can change my way of thinking, my way of talking, and and our way of actions. You notice Luke begins the book of Acts by referring back to his gospel in which he said he recorded those things which Jesus began both to do and to teach. So the book of Acts is not just a book of learning. It's not just a book from which we accumulate 
additional facts we didn't previously know about Christianity. But it's a book that also ought to affect the ways and the things which I do. And I hope that you will study this, not just in view of uh, using it to give you additional sermon material or to uh, debate someone who happens to be wrong in some of their teachings, but as we study it together, we'll be thinking also, how can this make me a better man? How can this make me more pleasing to the Lord? To take the things here very personal. And then also, we're studying the book of Acts that we might share it with others. That's the very thing that this book was written uh, to do. One of the reasons, we'll look at those later on, the purposes for the book. But you remember, the book of Acts begins, O Theopolis. And the gospel, he refers back to the gospel and tells uh, why he wrote him. So Luke is sharing with a friend, Theopolis, the story of Jesus and the story of how the church began and how it spread. And so our purpose in studying the book of Acts is not just to accumulate knowledge or to further our education, but that also, and we certainly hope at International Bible College, this will be one of your main purposes, that you might share this book and the facts from it and the great truths uh, with other people. Having, and there are certainly other reasons, but I felt like those were uh, some of the very best that will motivate you and make you want to study. You might want to share these with other people who are considering studying by means of video. But having looked at those purposes, let's talk a little bit about the syllabus. You will be given some material along with this video, and in that material will be a syllabus. Uh, it may read just a little bit differently from some of the ones we read from in this film because some of these are prepared for uh, live classes where we're in the classroom with the student, but there'll be not enough difference that would cause any kind of confusion. But if you will, uh, you don't need to look now because I'll be talking about it, but later on uh, or before the film and after you might consider the syllabus. And in this syllabus we have an introduction where we talk about what this course is. In this case, it's a verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of Acts, and it's, it's a means by which the student is going to learn an accurate and orderly account of the Christianity's origin and also of its spread. And this was, of course, led by the Holy Spirit. When you complete this detailed study, and it will be rather detailed, it will basically be verse by verse. There'll be times when it may be chapter by chapter, paragraph by paragraph. But most of the time, it will be verse by verse as time allows. But as you study the details of these missionary journeys, these sermons, many sermons recorded in this book, and the cases of conversion particularly, we hope you will be able to, and we intend for you to be able to know and to teach others the historical, the doctrinal, the devotional, personal, practical, and evangelistic application to the book. Let's look very briefly at those words. They weren't just put in here to sound impressive and to make it sound like that the teacher had a, a big, big job or this was a particularly important study over any others. What do we mean by you being able to understand from a study of this something about the historical background of the book? Brother W.B. West often says that we need to remember the Bible was written in history, not out of history. It wasn't written in a vacuum. And uh, the more we know about the, the one who wrote the book, those who received it, uh, the purpose for which it was written, the particular problems they had at that time, even the date at which it was written, uh, particularly important in some books like Revelation, and important really to all of them, but more than in some than others, that this gives us a historical perspective. We're not looking at the, the uh, text through 1991 or 1992 American glasses, but we're trying to look through first century glasses and understand as much as possible that it would help us to know uh, the background of the book. That's what we mean by historical. We want to talk a little bit about Luke and who he was and his perspective and, and who Theopolis was and those matters. And then doctrinal. Uh, Sometimes people say, not really fully understanding the meaning of the word, they say, well, I'm really interested in learning about God's love and about Jesus dying for me on the cross and the shedding of his blood and the great themes of the Bible. And certainly we are too. That's the main story, John 3.16. But they say, I'm not interested in doctrinal matters. I'm not, I don't, I'm not interested in debating or, or discussing with people doctrinal differences. But the word doctrine really is the same Greek word exactly we get our word teaching from. So if I say I'm not interested in the doctrines of the book of Acts, maybe not knowing it, but I'm really saying I wouldn't be interested in whether there's a God or not because that's a teaching of the Bible. Or whether Jesus was born of a virgin or whether or not he was resurrected and ascended to God. 
And so really I say more than I really intend to when I say I'm not interested in doctrinal matters. So when we say that we're going to look at the book doctrinally, we're not talking about just as a debate manual, but we're speaking about looking at the teachings, the great teachings that we find in this book and other books. And then we mention in this that one purpose would be devotional. And that simply means to draw you closer to God. Now one of the thrills I've had in teaching the book of Revelation is that I might read a chapter like the fourth chapter about God and not really thoroughly understand all the symbols and not understand the meaning of every verse. But no one, even a person of little education, cannot, can but read that book, that chapter, and have a feeling of awe and reverence for the power of God, for the beauty of God, for the dependence that we can have in God. And so in the book of Acts, there are chapters and verses that may not be easily understood, but they still give us a sense of awe and wonder and increase our devotion towards God. Let me share just one with you, and then when we reach it in our study, we can touch on it a little bit more lightly And because we look at it now. This is just for the purpose of kindly uh, whetting your appetite or letting you see, and maybe you already know, but share, with, share together the thrills of the book. The conversion of Saul, and this is one of the things, by the way, you'll be asked on the test. And isn't that nice for a teacher to tell you in advance some of the things that you'll be asked on the test? But one of the questions surely will be, what chapters record the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, who later became the great apostle Paul, the great missionary and preacher and minister, uh, who wrote some 13 or 14 books in the New Testament? And in the 26th chapter, which is the third chapter in Luke 9, uh, Acts 9, Luke records by the Holy Spirit's power what happened on the road to Damascus and afterwards. But in Acts 22 and Acts 26, Luke lets Paul tell his own story. And so in this second account by Paul, a third account in the book of Acts, we have this statement about Jesus speaking to Paul. Verse 16, chapter 22. But arise and stand upon thy feet, for to this end have I appeared unto thee, to appoint thee a minister and a witness both of the things which thou hast seen me, and of the things wherein I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I send thee, to open their eyes, that they may turn from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive remission of sins, and an inheritance among them that is sanctified by faith in me. What a great commission to be given to an apostle. He's really telling Paul in advance the, the uh, authority and the power and the commission by which he will operate. But then verse 19 is difficult for me to read without getting misty eyes. It's one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. And I think this is a devotional verse. We're talking about how to increase our devotion to God. Saul says, Wherefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. I was not disobedient. Now sometimes men are not disobedient to their vision because their vision is small. It's not very difficult to keep. Maybe some do not have any vision. And we're not just talking about miraculous visions as this one was. We're talking about any great dream or vision that you might have for working for God. Not to get credit for it or so you can praise yourself, but because you see some great need. And it, this is a devotional passage that will help you to accomplish that dream. But this is imp so impressive because when you turn over and read 2 Corinthians 11, where Paul lists or enumerates all of the opposition he had, when he talks about the shipwrecks and been left for dead, and you start thinking about the time he was stoned and they thought he was dead, and snake bitten, imprisoned, uh, beaten, uh, in spite of all of that, at this late time in his life, Paul says, I still was not disobedient to that vision. And I hope that the vision you may have, you may have a vision of being the first one to teach the gospel in a particular country, not so you can brag that, you know, I was the first missionary or gospel preacher there, but because we want to obey the Great Commission and we want the thrill of sharing the gospel with those who've never heard it. But you may have a vision of going the first one to certain sections of the states, some counties in the United States, still do not have the gospel, do not have a church. Maybe many countries overseas do not. And you have that vision, you have that dream. And then uh, 
things happen. Some of the people you wanted to support you don't want to support you. Some of the places you felt would be most supportive. Uh, you have marriage problems, you have financial problems, you have health problems, and, and gradually and slowly you arrive at a time and say, well, that was just a dream. I, I, I really can't do it. And there might be cases where providentially things change and we can't. But many times we give up our dream too easily. And this scripture ought to really inspire us, like Paul, to be able to stand one day and say, I was not disobedient to the vision that God gave me. Not miraculously, but by opportunities, by providence, by hearing about the needs of people. You may have a dream of doing a great benevolent work, medical benevolence. Uh, we've had this happen in our brotherhood, and thank God for those who do not give up their dreams. Let me cite one, and I have a special reason for this one, because it has to do with uh, what you will use in helping you to study, and we'll look a little bit later at some of the aids that we'll have to help us understand this great book. But J.W. McGarvey had a great vision and had a great dream, and his commentary I highly recommend to you, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Brother McGarvey wrote a commentary on the book of Acts, and then 30 years later he wrote a second commentary, which sometimes is referred to the new commentary. Brother McGarvey visited the Holy Land, and during that time he nearly drowned. I don't know all the circumstances and all of his thoughts. I wouldn't pretend to imagine those, but knowing, having read many of his sermons and knowing much about his personality, I cannot imagine Brother McGarvey saying, oh, Lord, you know all the good things I've done, you owe it to me. I don't think he'd try to, to bargain with God that way. Nor do I think he would try to bribe God by saying, if you'll just save me, uh, I will work harder than I ever have. But he did say that during that time when he was about to drown, that he recommitted and, and vowed to himself that he would uh, try his very best to teach others and share the gospel and continue to preach. And he survived that near drowning. And on the way back to the United States from that trip, he stopped by a European country and listened to some of the theologians that were teaching at that time uh, the documented hypothesis, the idea that Moses didn't write Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, that uh, somebody took scissors and called the scissors a paste theory, and you'll learn about that in other courses. But anyway, this bothered Brother McGarvey, and being a man of great vision, of being able to uh, see th things coming, good and bad, he realized that many times the th these theologians would teach their students, and they in turn would come to the states, and they would be on the staff of various seminaries and religious institutions or universities, and they would pass these ideas along. It would take those men maybe four or five years to graduate, and they would go out in pulpits, and maybe at first, uh, lest they fear being fired or losing their influence, would not just come out boldly and say the Bible was not inspired, the Bible was not written by the men that it says what it was and so forth, but they would gradually, and I remember talking to one man about this, he said, I've got too much sense to teach us the pulpit, they'd fire me immediately, but when my young people in my classes begin to ask questions, I try to help them understand this viewpoint. In other words, he was saying it'll be a generation later. In other words, McGarvey saw it was like a, a drop of rain that falls in a small ditch that goes into a creek, that goes into a river, that goes into the gulf and finally reaches the ocean. It takes a long time for that process. Only a man of his age and wisdom experience would have seen that. So he saw that he had several years to get ready for this. He came back to the United States. He had this vision of, of his brethren being prepared when that theory uh, came into our brotherhood and came into the States. He began to study that theory and all of the possibilities. He tried to maintain an honest and open mind. He tried to be very objective. And he wrote his great commentary on the book of Deuteronomy. And just as he had predicted and, and thought would happen, uh, many years later, when this, these theories that undermine faith in God and in the inspired word begin to come, many gospel preachers, many of them in rural areas, not well educated, had upon their desk Brother McGarvey's commentary on Deuteronomy and already knew the answers before the questions ever came. But the thrill... And the relation to this passage is that during that time, uh, brethren were very critical of Brother McGarvey. And, and we need to listen to our brethren. Oftentimes they, they give us correct directions. Don't, don't ignore good brethren who are trying to help us and trying to tell us that you don't need to go that way. But if we study the Word of God, we have enough experience and background to see a need. We've thought it through. We've listened to counsel. We've prayed about it. We've made up our mind this is something that needs to be done. This is something God would want me to do then regardless of what brethren or, or atheists or anyone else would do to discourage us, don't give up that vision. So Brother McGarvey in his study loved to preach, loved to travel, but he had enough self-discipline 
that he sat and studied and studied and studied and wrote and wrote and wrote. And brother was saying, Brother McGarvey, you're up there in your ivy-covered tower with all these academics, and, and you know, we'd say you're an egghead. And here we are out here fighting for survival. We're having to discuss instrumental music question and the Missionary Society question and, and all of these problems. And here you're off on some wild theory that you heard some German theologian say. And he loved his brethren and he coveted their, their counsel and, and their influence and their love and their admiration. And yet he had a vision. He knew what he needed to do. And he would not be deterred from that. And so when I think of Paul saying, I was not disobedient of that vision. I think of Brother Zedeby McGarvey and other men like him. And I hope that, that that devotional application of at least one section of Acts will increase your devotion, your determination. Whether you're trying to build a great orphan's home, do a great missionary work, uh, be a great youth worker, or meet some other great need in, in the brotherhood or in your country. That when you've counseled with others, you've listened to good men and women, you've read the Word of God, you've prayed about it, you know it's scriptural, you know it's right, you know it's needed, don't give up that vision. And, and, and like the Apostle Paul, one day you'll be able to stand in judgment and say, I was not disobedient to the vision that God gave you through opportunities. Another man along that line that inspires me is Brother T.B. Larimore, who was uh, a teacher and preacher in the very area right here where the uh, International Bible College is located. Brother, La Brother Larimore loved to preach the gospel. Uh, one of his best friends, Brother Strigley, was a great debater. Some people don't know that, and, and because of that, they make some uh, misjudgments of Brother Larimore. They thought he was a little bit soft on some things. Brother Larimore wanted to preach. He wanted to share the gospel particularly with those who had never heard it. And so he traveled from Canada to Cuba. This is back in the 1800s. He traveled from Carolinas to California. He traveled from Canada to Mexico and spreading the Word of God. He had a vision, and he saw the great need, and many brethren said the same thing to him that they'd said to McGarvey. We need you to be doing this and doing that. It was not that Brother Larimore thought that that was unimportant. He knew there were qualified men, uh, many more men doing that than doing what he was doing, and he bid them Godspeed and said amen to them, like his good friend Brother Srigley, who, who wrote for one of our gospel papers, but he refused to give up his vision. He refused to give up a great need that he saw. And would to God there had been a hundred others like him that the gospel might have been spread in those places. That may be more than you'd expect from one or two verses, but just wanted to share and did share that with you that you might see the kind of inspiration that you can get in a devotional way from the Word of God. Then it says not only the historical, doctrinal, and devotional, but personal. And we've already talked about that. One of the purposes of the book is that we, as a, as a child of God, might increase our uh, trying to be like Jesus and trying to do what God wants us to. Practical, that simply means that we'll be teaching the book in view of people beyond you. We're teaching these courses in view of the people you teach. And if you do not thoroughly understand that, it might make you wonder sometime about some of the things we do. For instance, uh, I have taught in countries where the people are 90% illiterate. Their IQ was probably higher than mine. I'm sure many of them were. But yet they were illiterate, and they depended a great deal on uh, my verbal teaching of them. You will be teaching people. Uh, I, we teach a great deal in prisons. The average education of a prisoner uh, is about fourth, fifth grade education. Again, they may have a very high IQ. Now, what does that have to do with this thing a practical way? We teach in such a way that you will be able to pass this along to people who maybe do not have the background you have. They do not have the motivation you have. They do not have the education that you have. And therefore, we sometimes will, what's called overkill. And you, you may be ready to say, well, that's enough. I'm ready to sign. I'll buy. What, <laughs> why go on? But we're trying to, to load you up with material that would enable you to explain very fully to other people uh, what you have learned from the Bible. And to do that, you, you need to use a great material. One of my favorite stories is a teacher said one time to me, said, David, if you go uh, hunting elephants and you're loaded for rabbit, you really get in trouble. But if you're loaded for elephants and rabbit gets up, you're okay. And what he's simply saying is you can't learn too much about a subject. You may not have to use it all. So we're trying to load you to, for elephants. We're trying to load you for far beyond what you may need personally. So at times you may be tempted to say, well, I understand that perfectly and you don't need to illustrate anymore. 
don't need any more information about that. Let's go on to the next point. But just keep in mind that we're trying to give you information that you might uh, very thoroughly teach another person who doesn't catch on as quickly, doesn't understand as fast as you have the things that we're saying. So this is what we mean by practical, things that we use in uh, teaching others, in your, uh, in your work as a minister, a teacher, in Bible class, home, stu home uh, teacher, people in studies, door knocking, whatever. And then last of all, it says that we're going to be making some evangelistic application to the book. And that simply means we're studying the book of Acts in view of encouraging you and giving you uh, cases of conversion and points from those that, would in, that would, you will share with others and help us to really carry the gospel into all the world like the Lord asks us to. That's all under introduction. You will see that in, those, in my words or uh, different words on your papers. Then let's talk a little bit about course, uh, course objectives. What are our, we've talked about our, our introduction and that includes some objectives, but some of the immediate objectives that you will have. When you complete this course, we believe that you will be able on a final test or during some of the testing to explain the immediate purposes for which the book was written, and you also will be able to know other purposes that it served. For instance, we'll point out some historical purposes which the book of Acts has served and some problems it has solved that probably at the time Luke didn't even realize it would be used for. God knew it, the Holy Spirit knew it, but Luke did not. That's what we mean by we will see immediate purposes of the book of, of Acts, and also we will see some purposes that it served, which maybe we're not. Also, you will notice in your syllabus that there are a list of memory verses. Uh, these verses might not be the same 20 years from now. They might not have been the same 40 years previous to this. I say that because someone may read them and say, well, wait a minute. These are not particular theme verses. These are not really the, the verses that prove the message of the book. But these verses have been chosen by men, like we've already talked about, of vast experience in all kinds of situations. And while they may not 20 years from now be the verses you'd most need to know, they are verses we've chosen by our experience to be the ones that will be very, very practical right now for you to use in home studies and sermons and debate our personal devotions. As different doctrines arise and go away, as different theories come up on the scene, uh, a different emphasis might be. This is not to say these verses are the most important verses in the book. It's not to say they're more true than the others. It's simply to say, as older men of experience, we're saying these verses you will find very, very useful in the ministry of the decade in which we live, in the century in which we live. So look at those verses. You will notice that some of the verses have an A or B or C by them. If it says a verse and has an A, that simply means you must memorize the first phrase of that verse. If it's a B, it will mean the middle verse, uh, phrase. If it's a C, it will be the last part. I was amused and also uh, interested. It was helpful to me. And I like for students to ask questions. I want you to feel free to do that. But a few years ago, a freshman here got almost upset with me and said, Brother Underwood, you're doing violence to the Word of God. How can you just take a verse and tear it up like that? Why don't we memorize the whole verse? And I tried to very kindly, without trying just to be humorous and witty, to point out to him that men, and we're glad they have because it makes it so convenient to, I can call someone on the phone and say, what do you think about Acts 26, 13? Uh, men have divided this after it was written into chapters and verses as a matter of convenience. And so I pointed out to the student that someone else has divided these paragraphs up into verses. Would you say to him what you're saying to me? Uh, why not memorize the whole verse? Well, since Paul didn't write it in verses, why not memorize the whole chapter? And then, since really men divide the chapters, what right do we have to divide them? Why don't we memorize the whole book? Now, I think the students saw real quickly he didn't want that for that kind of assignment. So it's not an attempt to uh, pervert the Word of God or to twist it to change the meaning. It is these memory verses are selected because of particular points that we feel are useful. And we are most happy if you memorize the book or the paragraph or the chapter or the whole verse. But in, in, in this course, as a as requirement, the only thing we're asking in, in terms of this class is that you memor, memorize, you must memorize, to be graded at least, uh, the ones that we point out. So that'll help understand when you see the A's and the B's and C's. The, uh, let's talk a little bit about the assignments now that you will have along with watching the film and listening to me. Uh, number one assignment will be to read the book through at one sitting. And I'm 
going to spend a little more time on this and probably you will enjoy it. But remember back what we said just a few moments ago, that we're doing this in view of you're trying to get other people to do it. Uh, I can walk into class here and say, students, read the book all the way through before next week. And I can bring some pressure. I can say, if you don't, you're going to get a D. And they've paid money for tuition, and they have all kind of motivations. But when we go out in a community or, or in, a, in a congregation, and we say, we're going to teach a Wednesday night class or Sunday night class, how do you motivate those people? You can't say, I'll give you a D, I'll give you an F. Why should they come and study? You need some kind of motivation for that. Well, how, how could you get a class in congregation where you are, or a group, whatever uh, group you might be teaching, how would you get them to, to read the book all the way through at one sitting? Uh, how would you motivate them? First of all, it's a, it's a Bible principle. It's one that, that you know, we did not think up. But it seems that they read the book often all the way through. Notice in the close of the book of Colossians, uh, Paul says in Colossians 4.16, And when this epistle hath been read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that ye also read the epistle from Laodicea. Even a little bit more pointed, the very next book after Colossians, and as Paul closes the writings of 1 Thessalonians, he makes a similar statement. Right to the end of the book, verse 27, chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians, I adjure you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the brethren. We can appreciate the fact that then they not only did not have one Bible per member, they didn't even have one Bible per congregation until they were copied. And think what a task that would be to copy it by longhand. And then they were circulated. And uh, you can imagine they're getting a letter from Paul and the thrill of reading that letter to the whole congregation. In Revelation, the first chapter, where it's, there are several blessings pronounced there, and one of them is, Blessed is he that reads this book. And the Greek word for read there is the word they use for public reader. That probably was a man who stood up and read uh, for two reasons at least, because there weren't enough to go around and also because many people could not read. So he would be a public reader. What's that got to do with what we're talking about here? It is. It shows that we need to read the book just like they did all the way through. Uh, that's not the only way we're going to study it, but we want to read it all the way through to get an overview. So please do that between the first uh, tape uh, video and the second one that you will hear. And we're not talking about studying. Uh, we're not talking about looking up references or trying to solve problems or comparing it with what the Bible says on the subject other places or looking up definitions. We're talking about just a quick, fast reading like you'd read a newspaper article to get the overall view of this book. Can you imagine someone in the church at Corinth or some other place uh, getting up on Sunday morning and saying, Oh, brethren, we have a letter here from Paul, and he's in prison, or he's having this experience, and I'm going to read you the first page, and next Sunday when you come back, we'll read you the second page of this letter. We can't imagine that. And we're going to show in a moment there's a time to do that. But you can't imagine they're not having at least one occasion when they would read the letter all the way through. It was written. They were written as letters. This was written as a letter at Theopolis, and therefore it ought to be read just as you would any other letter that you would get. First of all, read it all the way through. This gives you a pers uh, perspective that you otherwise cannot get. And I just wish, I really wish that some teacher had required this of me back when I was 19 or 20 years old instead of uh, when I was in graduate school. I'd been preaching several years. I had read some books all the way through at one sitting, but not very often. But it's only when it became a requirement and I had to do it that I began to appreciate it. And now I require that in all classes that I teach. And I try to discipline myself when I'm studying with someone else about a book. I hear a preacher preach an expository sermon that covers an entire book. I try to go home, and whether it means sitting up to 1 or 2 o'clock to read that book all the way through. By the way, surveys have shown that of the 66 books of the Bible, that more than half of them, that is 33, uh, any one of which can be read in 30 minutes or less. And we're not again, we're not talking about studying in detail. We're talking about reading. Uh, that means we talk about reading the Bible through in a year, and you know we feel real proud of those kind of things. When we do that, we're just really kind of playing around. Uh, the Bible would not be difficult to read through in 66 days. That may shock you. But you have to remember that books like uh, Second and Third John and Jude and many of the other epistles, you could read uh, those, several of them in an hour, and that gives you a head start. Then 
Of course, you can't read a book like Psalms or Genesis in, in half an hour. Back to the survey, though. The, the surveyors have said that the average reader could read uh, uh, any one of half the books of the Bible in 30 minutes or less, and that most of them can be read in an hour or less. Now, obviously, again, that would not include Psalms or Genesis. I'm just saying this to encourage you to become a greater reader of God's Word and to set higher goals. And particularly if you are going, going to be a minister and evangelist and teacher of others, uh, you will want to be better and better acquainted. You, you, have to, you have to know more than the one you're teaching, or should. And so let me encourage you in all of your Bible studies, whether your other teachers are required or not, when you are going into the study of a book by video or by any other means, read that book all the way through. Now, we said we're going to overkill. We're going to give you more than you need. What else would you say to a congregation or a class of people to try to get them to see this? Uh, as theologians or as teachers, we might uh, use some motivation that, that would not always work on the ordinary man. Uh, the story is told of the blind men. You know, they went to the zoo. Someone took some blind men to the zoo to try to help them understand better what the world was like that they could not see. And uh, this is an old, old parable, a story. And so when they came back, uh, someone asked them, said, tell us what you saw in the zoo. And they said, well, we saw an elephant. Well, what is an elephant? What, does, what is an elephant like? And one of them who had just fell to the elephant's tail said, well, elephant's like a rope. And another one, and this is certainly not to uh, reflect upon people's handicap. I have some physical handicaps myself. I understand that. But it's simply to illustrate. But another blind man fell to the side of the elephant. And he said, well, elephant's like a wall. And the third man said, having fell to the leg of the elephant, said, oh, elephant's like a tree trunk. Well, what was the problem? They all were right, and yet they were all wrong because they gave some description of the elephant, but they didn't really full, uh, understand in their mind what the whole elephant would look like. And therefore, we study sometimes the, the Bible by chapters and verses, and we don't get the overall picture. If you were asked to survey a certain county area in your land, you might go up in an airplane and oversee it. I never will forget the first time I flew. And I saw immediately that my perspective was not near what it ought to be as to that area. I had hunted. I had fished. I had traveled all over that area. I thought I knew it like the back of my hand. I knew the towns and the congregations. And yet when I flew over to an airplane, I saw that uh, my uh, vision of what it would look like, the angle of the rivers and how close it was to the forest and how this uh, related to it, I was all wrong. It gave me a whole new picture of that area. And yet if you were going to write about, uh, if you are going to write a complete uh, analysis of a particular county, you would then come down and you would probably analyze the soil and see what chemicals are in it. You would look at the insects, the birds, and so forth. So you would have a two-pronged study to fully understand that. Now, this is not to say the detailed study. You say, Brother Underwood, you mean what about these preachers that take one verse and just spend all day on it or several days? I remember Brother Gus Nichols being assigned a book, and he would spend uh, several sermons on the first verse or two of that particular book, like we will spend some time particularly on Acts first, second chapter. Is that wrong? Can you be too detailed? No, we're not talking about either or. We're talking about both and. At another time, not right now, but another time, look at Galatians 3, verse 16, where Paul bases not just an illustration or some Old Testament uh, narrative, but where he bases a cardinal argument uh, or teaching about Jesus Christ and his deity on not only one verse and not only one word, but whether that word can be used as a singular as well as a plural. Now, if, if the apostles can look back at a scripture and choose one word and make a sermon out of it, it's certainly not wrong for us to do this. So don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that, uh, and, and too many teachers in some faiths have taken too much of a general view. They, they can give you a survey of many, many books, and yet they've overlooked some of the very vital commands and teachings of single verses in those scriptures. Sometimes God only says something one time. And we, if we believe in God, believe in inspiration, one time is enough. It's all, all God needs to say it. So we need to look in detail at every verse and every word. But in addition to that, have this overall view that would give us a better understanding. I would guess that if you were to stop people on the street uh, that were members of the church and ask them, what is Acts 6 about? I mean, Romans 6 chapter about? That probably the average person would say, well, it talks a lot about baptism. I remember Romans 6, you know, 1 through 5, we're buried with the Lord in baptism. And they'd not be altogether wrong.
But when you go back and read Romans 5 and Romans 7, in fact, look at the book, you actually understand that the subject in Romans 6 was uh, the grace of God and Christian living that's fitting a God that loves us and to live uh, like you understand why you were baptized. So one important aspect of education is you take a person with what they know and help them to come to know what they do not know. We move from the known to the unknown. And so Paul takes their thorough understanding and knowledge about baptism, which he assumes, and says, why, why do you not live and, and act like uh, the purpose for which you were baptized? Someone has said that uh, there are very few arguments in the Bible for baptism. First time a man said that, I'm, I was about ready to disagree with him very strongly. And then I realized that by so saying, he really emphasized baptism. What he was saying was that baptism was so clearly taught and it was so clearly understood in the first century that it seldom was challenged. They might challenge faith or whether Christ was a Messiah or many other matters in the teaching, but once they accepted that, that baptism was just mentioned as a matter of course and believing they were baptized. We'll see that in the book of Acts. It's like it's the most normal. What else do you expect them to do? And so this man that's speaking about Romans 6 and saying that baptism is seldom argued, he's simply saying that it was a great cardinal truth that was taught and accepted, uh, very little objection to it, and they would often take that accepted, that proven matter, and move on from it to what they felt the people did not know or were not emphasizing. So, see, if you had read the book of Romans all the way through, you would not say Romans 6 is about baptism. You would say it's about Christian living based upon the purpose for which we do obey the gospel and become a baptized people. So we will be reading the book through at one sitting between this video and the next one. The second assignment we will talk a little bit about in, in the next video and hopefully then get right on into uh, who wrote the book and when it was written and the dates and why it's called the Acts of the Apostles and some matters like that. Uh, this is a thrilling book. You're going to really enjoy getting into the first chapter. But someone has said that it's like all of life. You know, when we think about marriage, we think about falling in love, we think about the engagement, the wedding, the honeymoon, all the great things about marriage. But after a while, there comes the dirty dishes and dirty diapers. And maybe this is the dirty dishes, dirty diapers part of studied getting. I, I you know, wish we didn't have to always look at dates and authors and all these facts. And when I was much younger, we mainly just talked to people about, you know, what does the Bible say? Because that was the question. It was not really, but you're living in a different time. People are saying now, well, I don't believe Luke wrote this book. I don't believe it was written in the first century. I don't believe it's inspired. And so we have to back up and start at a, at a previous point. We wish we didn't have to. We wish people didn't have these doubts. And they would all, you know, accept it as the Word of God. And we just open the book, start with verse 1, and go into it. But we want you to be prepared to help people who really do not believe the Bible is inspired. God loves them too, and they have a soul. And so this might be a part that is not very interesting. I hope it will be. We're trying to make it so. But I promise you, not because you're a teacher, but because of the nature of the book itself, you are really going to get excited and enjoy the contents of the book of Acts, beginning with the first chapter, and we'll spend a great deal of time on the first chapter and the second chapter. Beginning now, and I will repeat this many times, if you will master the first and second chapter of Acts, in my experience, you will answer more questions. You will solve more problems. You'll be introduced to more different teachings in the Bible than any other two chapters that I know. That's not to belittle any other passage. They're, they're great, great passages. But I'm just saying in my experience, I don't know of any two chapters anywhere in the Bible where as many questions are cleared up, where as many different teachings are given, and where as many understandings on so many different subjects uh, are before us as in these two chapters. So I'm asking you at the very beginning, begin to read the book, but master the first two chapters particularly. Really master those first two chapters. Beginning next film, we will talk about outlining the book. We want you to make an outline of this book, use some help, but really make it mainly yours, and that will be the next assignment. It's been a thrill to be with you this time. I'm looking forward to being with you in the next film again. I'm so honored and privileged that you've let me sit down with you and that we have really studied together and beginning to study this great book of God. Thank you very much.